So Punk Hazard feels like an arc almost entirely around buildup and secrets. This arc was utterly unpredictable as it goes from a fire island to an ice island, which blew my mind when I put it together. Then there's even more questions like what's the deal with all the poison gas? Why are there dragons here? And why are there giant babies? It felt like it's an arc where anything could happen. The scientists, villains, and pirates all have plans, but like almost everything is kept a secret from us until the end. Even when the cards are revealed, it is an arc almost entirely around setup for later arcs. But let's start off by talking about the atmosphere of Puck Hazard, right? It is an island evenly split in half by Aokiji and Akainu's fight. We had already seen emperors with enough strength to split the sky, and not to mention Marineford that was practically freezing over with lava coming from above. That sounds, uh, that sounds really apocalyptic when I say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> but what helps uh, fuel the atmosphere of Punk Hazard, though, is like the Cool Brothers guarding the snowy side of the island and Vegapunk's dragons guarding the fire side of the island. The dragons really did make me question whether having dragons around Punk Hazard was really like a good idea, though, especially because as far as I can tell, you can't control them at all. That just seems like a liability waiting to happen, Vegapunk. Let's also talk about the stinky gas of Punk Hazard, right? In Punk Hazard, there's gas that came from Caesar essentially wanting to create a nuclear bomb with its effects lingering around the space for years. And because of this, the entirety of Punk Hazard has, uh, well, as the name suggests, become a hazard. One of my favorite moments actually came from the fact that Punk Hazard had been closed for years and Usopp was seemingly worried of entering it because, well, you would be committing a crime if you were to go in there, says one of the most wanted pirates around. So Caesar had created essentially a nuclear bomb and then later on, Caesar is doing the same thing again, this time two years later, trying to make gas that kills people on contact. Kind of. I mean, okay, I got some beef with you, Oda. Besides Marine Ford, death is non-existent in One Piece. Because when I first saw this happen, like exactly this panel right here, I thought like, wow, this is actually really fascinating. The Marines are giving up their lives and dying to the gas so that their captain would live. That is beautiful. Pretty sure it's going to be undone somehow. That's it! That's what I was thinking! In the midst of like what should be a sad, tragic, sacrificial moment, I was waiting for the undo button. Because clearly not even like background characters without names can die. And then guess what? That's exactly what happens! <laughs> Turns out there's a way to reverse the gas effect and that's just messed up. The stakes are gone now and that makes me a little sad. The gas introduced an interesting concept though, which is artificial devil fruits. These artificial devil fruits were apparently deemed as a failure by Vegapunk, even though, uh, well, it worked. There's a ton of questions that this brings up, like how exactly does a sad gas turn fruits into artificial devil fruits? The naming convention is also pretty sus. We get a sad gas that turns into a smile fruit. Maybe because it's going from something that's inherently toxic to something that is seemingly amazing. It ended up creating zoan type devil fruits, which I think is interesting within its own right because it only creates zoan types. So what makes zoan types easier to create than others? Okay, so here's my theory. If devil fruits within themselves have souls, then artificial devil fruits just have souls of dead animals, which is very depressing. <laughs> But it explains why Vegapunk made a dragon and then subsequently made a dragon devil fruit user. As long as you can make a mythical creature, you can in turn make a mythical Zoan type devil fruit. Okay, so I actually think this arc had a lot of weird quirks to it. Ironically enough, after Fishman Island where Luffy claims not wanting to be a hero, this is probably the most selfless heroic arc so far. Previously, we had seen Luffy help people like Vivi get somewhere or even just help individual people in each arc, but here, the Straw Hats go out of their way to help people multiple times outright stating, hey, I'm here to help you, I'm not the bad guy. And this goes for practically every character. Luffy outright stating at the start of the arc, we gotta go help these people, 
Nami stating that we can't leave these children here, we gotta save them, with Chopper going beyond that to make sure that the kids are also healthy, and Sanji making sure that the samurai is put back together and doesn't die on his watch. It just caught me so off guard to be that straightforward. I think my best guess is that this is an overcorrection. If Fishman Island leans so hard into the I'm not a hero slash good guy thing, then I think Punk Hazard overcorrects in the other direction. Then again, uh, this has been like a major theme in One Piece, the blurry line of who is what that uh, we can even see all the way back in Romance Dawn. That being said, I really enjoyed the character dynamics this arc. Not only do we have a lot of good pairings within the Straw Hats themselves, but also new pairings with the introduction of Smoker, Tashigi, and Law. Probably my favorite pairing right off the bat is Luffy and Law. I think that the partnership has really interesting long-term effects, but I also just love how the entire crew is trying to warn Law that he might have made a mistake teaming up with Luffy. <laughs> um, on Law's side, I feel like we get to see a lot of his perspective on how Luffy treats his crew and others like Smoker and Tashigi in a really different way than he does. Like how if Chopper or Nami want to stay on an island, Luffy's not going to leave them behind until they're done doing what they have to do there. I also think the kids pulled a lot of weight in this arc since a lot of the character interactions are with them. Nami drives a lot of the early story with her demanding the crew helps out the kids. Then Frankie follows suit, making the kids feel safer, and they're singing about the Frankie tank. And then, of course, we got Chopper, who is actually contributing with his role as a doctor in an attempt to cure all the children of this addiction that they've been given. And of course, if we're going to be talking about character dynamics, I feel like we have to talk about the body switching thing, which, I mean, it has some flaws, but to be fair... It also has a lot of good moments. I really liked Robin uh, disliking anything Frankie was doing inside of Chopper's body. And I also like Nami struggling to cope with being in Frankie's body while everyone else is just laughing at their misfortune. The worst ones were probably ones that you could have guessed. I wasn't the biggest fan of the jokes surrounding Sanji's moments. But at the very least, they became way more enjoyable when Zoro was stuck babysitting Sanji and Brooke because then the whole situation just flips on its head and they go from being happy to just suffering the whole time. I'm also here for Nami suffering when she got swapped with Sanji's body, which is like the one person that you don't want to be stuck in. It makes Law's Devil Fruit my favorite Devil Fruit so far in terms of visual spectacle and potential scenarios. We can also take this time to talk about G5, the most like ragged group of Marines. And you can tell with a G5 just causing mayhem and Tashigi having trouble getting them to follow her orders. A lot of my favorite G5 interactions were with Sanji here as they eventually look up to him and follow his orders. It's kind of the first time we've seen anything like this in One Piece outside of maybe Romance Dawn? Seriously, outside of G8 or any other filler, we get almost no interactions between the Straw Hats and the Marines. Okay, so I mentioned that Tashigi actually struggled to control a lot of the Marines here, but I love how in the end we got to see the Marines still following her orders and even, again, sacrificing themselves for their captain. I like this character arc of G5 from being a rugged, uncontrollable marine group to being one that actually follows and listens to their captain. That being said though, I do wish Tashigi had a lot more value in a lot of her moments. Tashigi got promoted to a captain and then immediately just gets trashed by almost everyone fighting her. I get that the Straw Hats need to have their moments in the light, but Tashigi got no victories, I think. Smoker also didn't have that many victories in this arc, but I did like a lot of his moments though, whether it was his declaration on maintaining justice while fighting Virgo, which, when he says it, feels like a genuinely powerful moment, to him fully protecting and genuinely taking responsibility over his marines. While we're talking about characters, we might as well do a character study on Doflamingo. We had barely seen him over the course of the series, and in this arc, we get a really interesting read in his character. 
on the one hand, he's apparently one of the most ruthless people around and you don't want to mess with him, which considering how he owns Sabaody's market, uh, yeah, that makes sense. And on the other hand, he doesn't really fight a lot of his subordinates and he's thanking his subordinates and shifting the blame on himself when stuff goes wrong. And that seems really interesting to me. While there is more to his kit, his Devil Fruit ability was focused around control and manipulation, and I can't get a good read on him, so it brings up a lot of interesting thoughts about what his true intentions are in every scene. And, uh, and oh boy, true intentions are a difficult thing to understand in Punk Hazard. Turns out, there's a lot of moving parts. Let's talk about the intentions surrounding Punk Hazard. I'm talking about giant babies. <laughs> Apparently the world government was planning on creating giants, and while it hasn't worked yet, the goal is arguably to give them a bigger advantage. Because, well, as we saw in Marineford, if another person was to challenge the world government, some pretty big stuff can go down. Imagine if Whitebeard got close to ending stuff, and then Shanks tagged himself in and continued that fight. Like, who knows what could have gone down. Especially when we consider how the worst generation is teaming up, I can definitely see the world government planning for like a Marine Ford 2 kind of scenario. Alright, so here's something that I find really interesting. In a cover page, we see that Doflamingo shop in Sabaody is not around anymore. And contextually, it makes so much more sense. In the Sabaody arc, he says that slave trading is so old fashioned because now we're in the age of smiles. I love how this was set up all the way back in Sabaody. Around this time, Doflamingo shifted over and capitalized on this market with Caesar, giving a ton of smiles to Kaido to create his furry army. And so I guess the big picture is that Doflamingo planted himself right in the middle of all of this giving himself exclusive access to smiles. It also came with a really big downside though, which is that when it all begins to crumble down, for example, if Caesar's not around anymore to keep producing small fruits, then the backlash would be damaging. Okay, so one of the many interesting things I like about this Age of Smiles is that by extension, the slave shop closed down in Sabaody. So is there a chance that it'll affect the reverie? Would this, by extension, manage to push Fishman Island's note because slavery has been reduced there? I kind of doubt it. Again, I don't really trust the world government here, but hey, I think it would be a plot twist if it did go well. <laughs> Alright, let's talk about the Wano Samurai. I love that this arc pulls us in a ton of different directions, one of which being from the Samurai Guy. Samurais are exclusive to Wano, and I like that their border restrictions create a really interesting multi-island conflict, something that we honestly haven't seen at all. I think the closest thing would be Amazon Lily, or Drum Island, and Alabasta. Not only does the samurai have beef with Punk Hazard as Caesar kidnapped his reptile kid, but also he has beef with Dress Rosa as it has yet another member of his group. By the end of the arc, I thought he was going to stick around with the marines, but I kind of like him seemingly going on a journey with a crew to dress Rosa as his plotline neatly ties into that arc. That's right, it's another VV situation of having to transport someone from one island to another. So as I mentioned at the start of this arc, I'm invested in this setup. On the one hand, we have Apu, Hawkins, and Kid who formed an alliance, and I don't know why... I honestly can't think of anything. Like, are they also going to challenge another Yonko? So in this arc, we're seeing a lot of people call rookies the eye of the storm, which I love because everyone already knows that things are gonna go down. It's just a matter of when, especially when they're teaming up. And I'm particularly interested in it because I would love to see some piratey backstabs between the allied groups. I also want to talk about Law who became a warlord and, as far as I remember, didn't get punished for allying with the Straw Hats. So I'm just fascinated to see what he'll do since he doesn't have punishments while someone like Doflamingo now does. Lastly, I want to close it off by talking about something Luffy mentioned. Luffy throughout the story has been friends and allies with so many people, good and bad, and I find this ideology fascinating. I've mentioned that the world of piracy in One Piece is kind of structured like a ladder. The further you progress in the Grand Line, the stronger people get, 
And the more people you defeat, the closer you are to becoming king. And what I absolutely adore is that Luffy, despite being allies with so many people, also acknowledges this ladder. Everyone here is competing in the game to become king. At the end of Fishman Island, Luffy said he was going to take down Big Mom. And at the end of Punk Hazard, he made a bold declaration to take down Kaido. And despite looking up to and liking him, he also has no complaints about having to take down Shanks. So that brought a ton of questions to me, like if Luffy is eventually going to fight all of the rookies and even fight Shanks, I want to know what kind of scenarios Luffy would be in to go up against everyone. Either way, I guess I'm going to have to find out. In the meantime though, thanks to all my patrons here who, with the power of Lost Devil Fruit, I'm able to switch. Haha, <laughs> I, I swapped them. Look at you, you're all in the wrong spot. Now you're stuck like that for who knows how long. I, I'll fix it later at some point. <laughs>